We've seen us conquer the hardest challenges on WWE 2K23 My GM Mode, but what if I try to be an impossible one? Today, I'll be trying to gain the most fans out of every brand in every single week. As soon as I'm not the highest gainer, the video will be over and we'll have lost the challenge. To make things even harder for myself, I'll be playing on hard settings with the lowest budget, snake draft format and no shakeups. If I want to get far in this challenge, my drafting is going to have to be on point, alongside my stamina and rivalry management. In previous runs, we've been able to put on the odd bad show to reserve stamina and make sure our PLEs are top tier. But in this one, that isn't an option. Every show has to be a blockbuster as we can't run the risk of another brand gaining more fans. So with all of that in mind, welcome to the Invincible MyGM Challenge. To start things off, I decided to choose Tyler Breeze as my GM. His power card allows you to regain 20 stamina on all of your stars immediately, and that will come in handy as we get past the first premium live event. Then, for the brand, it was a toss-up between NXT and NXT 2.0. In the end, I decided to go with NXT, as I think having a week where I'm basically guaranteed to win will be a nice safety net to have. Now, for the opponents, I thought I'd mix things up and let a randomised wheel decide who I'd be facing. This doesn't necessarily make anything harder, but it was a fun way to make the run that bit more unique. Our first opponent's gonna be... hopefully not Mick Foley... Xavier Woods. Okay, not too bad. And next up is... oh no... Mick Foley, the man that plagues our existence every time we face him. Great. And finally we have... Adam Pearce. Okay, that's a pretty harsh group of GMs and I'm really not happy about having to face Foley. So, that didn't quite go to plan. Playing against Mick is always frustrating, as his power card is just so disruptive. If he uses it on you, you're guaranteed two long-term injuries in your next show, and that always has the capability to derail everything. But nevertheless, even though it wasn't ideal, it was the hand that I was dealt, so I just had to live with it. In terms of the draft, this part was more crucial than ever. In order to put on the best shows that I possibly could, I needed to have plenty of good matchups, a decent amount of star power, and a lot of stamina. I ended up signing Edge, Bobby Lashley, LA Knight, Akira Tozawa, T-Bar, Wes Lee, Dexter Loomis, Grayson Waller, Braun Strowman and Humberto in the men's division. Then for the women's division, I signed EO Sky, Dewdrop, Nikita Lyons, JC Jane, Gigi Dolin and Natalia. Then for my champions, I went with the obvious choices of Edge and EO Sky, as in order to put on good shows every single week, I was going to need a great opener and main event, and these two could offer me just that. Going into week 1, I was nervous, as I knew that this was one of the hardest weeks to get right throughout the whole run. The reason for this is that it's kind of a blank canvas. Everyone is in the same position with no rivalries, increased popularity or star power yet, so results really could go a number of different ways. In fact, it was so up to chance that I even debated using my fighting champion power card to guarantee the win, but thankfully I decided against it. I put on two tag team matches and a North American title match just to make sure I was crowning as many new champions as I could. This meant that I wouldn't just be putting on a better show in terms of match ratings, but I would also be gaining a lot more popularity on five more of my stars. After a bit of planning, I settled on this show, with the men's tag team belts on the line in the opener and the men's title as the main event. Then the mid cards would be the women's tag team match and the North American title match. I made the opener and main event both tables matches to boost the ratings and hopefully get a good booking score. Then also had the women's tag match as a tables due to their popularity and star power being a bit lower than the rest of the card. For the promos, I had Dewdrop calling out EO Sky to start their rivalry, which would turn out to be a key one for this challenge. And then I made sure that I would gain as many fans as possible by booking two charity promos as well. For those of you that might not know, charity promos cost $10,000 to put on, but guarantee you a set amount of extra fans gained per one. So these were going to be crucial for a challenge where I have to outperform my opponents in every single show. As far as the actual show was concerned, it didn't go to plan whatsoever. We picked up a 2.5 star in the men's tag team match as Wesley and LA Knight became the new champions, then Dewdrop did a great job of calling out EO Sky, and that rivalry is well underway. But this is where it all went wrong. In the first mid-card match, the women's tag team put on a brilliant 3.5 star performance, which I was not expecting at all given the fact they not only had less popularity and star power than the others, but the match also contained two specialists, so they weren't even getting the full class type bonus on offer either. Fortunately though, the second mid-card and main event matched the drama curve and yielded some decent results, but I was scared that I'd ruin this in week 1. I can't lose immediately as that would be a disaster. 
As the results rolled in, I braced myself as I received a poor opening rating and only a mere 48,000 fans. SmackDown then gained 35,000 fans, Raw gained 42,000 fans, and NXT 2.0 gained 46,000 fans. That was way too close for my liking. We survived, but only by the skin of our teeth. If it weren't for those charity promos, this run would already be over, and that was the wake-up call that I needed. Week 2 rolled around, and of all people, Adam Pearce decided to give it large, telling me that he was going to take SmackDown to the top. I really wouldn't be running my mouth if I only gained 35,000 fans. With Week 1 being such a close call, I knew that I had to step it up. I checked the power card store to see if there was anything on offer to give me the upper hand, and despite there being a card available to boost the ratings of a Fool's Count Anywhere match, I opted against buying it as $50,000 was a lot of money, and I needed to save cash for shows to put on good match types. The women's tag match put on an amazing show last time, so I decided to have that as my opener with an extreme rules stipulation. Then for the main event, Dewdrop and EO Sky would have their first match for the women's title, and I was excited for this one. With both of the mid cards being comfortably worse than the matches next to them, I headed into the show full of optimism. Once again, the women's tag match delivered, with a 4 star rating for their Extreme Rules match, and this was the perfect start after such a lacklustre opening to week 1. Next up was our stamina saver match between the two extra stars that we drafted. Dexter Loomis fought Grayson Waller and got a pathetic 1.5 star rating, but at least that's good for the drama curve. Humberto took down Brown Snowman once again to retain his title in a 3 star match. And in the main event, Dewdrop put EO Sky through a table to win the women's championship at the first time of asking. We received a good booking rating and a much healthier 54,000 fans this week, with SmackDown gaining 47,000, Raw gaining 41,000, and NXT 2.0 gaining 45,000. Now we'd built up a bit of momentum and got some key rivalries underway, things were looking up. Week 3 posed some problems though. JC Jane demanded a rematch against Natalia, but Natalia had less than 40 stamina already. Thankfully, I had two weeks to book this match, so I accepted the offer and chose to give Natalia the week off completely to regain the maximum amount of stamina possible. I checked the power card store and contemplated buying a match boost card, but spending a quarter of our total budget to boost one match seemed silly at this stage. Instead, I used my money elsewhere, as I realised that I hadn't been putting enough match variety into my shows. I wanted to introduce a triple threat match into the mix, so Grayson Waller and Dexter Loomis could continue their rivalry while I also benefited from the additional match type. The only issue was, I didn't have a third spare wrestler to throw in. So I did what all good GMs do and headed straight for the jobbers, and wouldn't you know it, my luck was in. After triple fusion neck surgery, a hip replacement, and five metal plates being placed into his spine, Jackson Smooth was back and ready to do it all over again. I signed him and threw him straight into the triple threat match with Loomis and Waller, knowing the risk that I was running. But we needed a third competitor, and Smooth was always ready to put his body on the line for NXT. In arguably the greatest triple threat match of all time, we only received a 1.5 star rating, which I can only imagine is because Smooth didn't win. He was the obvious choice to go over, and the fans all knew that. Another good booking, but only 53,000 fans gained this week. Fortunately, the only other brand to get close to us was Raw, and they were still 5,000 fans off. But I knew that they'd up their game sooner or later, and it was only a matter of time. I still needed to improve a lot, and that's when it happened. Mick Foley applied his Cactus Jack power card to us, guaranteeing two long-term injuries after our next show. This is the exact reason why I didn't want to face him, as this card always causes so many headaches when you face it. But that was the hand I was dealt, and I just had to do my best to cope with it. I decided to act like it was any other week and just take the hit, as I didn't really have a choice. I was most concerned about my women's title match, as they were set to be a level 4 rivalry for the PLE, and I was going to need their match to boost my ratings. However, Edge and Lashley needed a bit of a rest, so I ran the risk and put them in a tables match in the main event. The show kicked off with a 3 star women's tag match and saw Edge and Lashley's rivalry grow to level 3. Then Dexter Loomis picked up the win in a 2 star triple threat match which had Jackson Smooth competing again, despite there being the risk of him falling victim to the very power card that started his miserable string of long term injuries. The men's tag team then picked up a 2.5 star rating, with the main event yielding a 4 star rating between Zoodrop and EO Sky, and their rivalry was now at boiling point. But what if it was one of them that got injured? Could our entire week 5 PLE be ruined by Mick Foley yet again? We got a good booking and 56,000 fans, which was comfortably the most this week. 
But then, the fans of NXT were hit with some shocking news. Jackson Smooth had suffered yet another long-term injury thanks to Mick Foley's power card. His family have all come out publicly to beg him to retire, but as the ambulance left the arena that night with Jackson's broken and bruised body in it, he made it clear that he would be back. One day, he'll return to the ring and get his hands on a title. You take it easy, Jackson, and thank you for taking the hit yet again for NXT. Oh, and JC Jane was out for five weeks, meaning we didn't have a women's tag match to put on either. The first premium live event was upon us, and I knew it had to be a big show. I couldn't rely on the other brands messing up this week, so I used my fighting champion power card. Even though I couldn't put on my women's tag match, I'd still have four matches getting a big boost, so this show was bound to be a hit. I headlined Extreme Rules with my hottest feud, Dewdrop vs EO Sky in a Hell in a Cell match for the women's championship. The rest of the card also had big stipulations to close out the rivalries, as I knew that after this show I could use Tyler Breeze's quick recovery power card to gain 20 stamina back on everyone, and we needed to go all out here. We started off with a banger. Lashley vs Edge in a steel cage got us a 5 star match rating with Bobby coming out on top. Then, after putting on stinker after stinker, Grayson Waller and Dexter Loomis actually produced a 4 star match to end their rivalry, and it only got better from there. Humberto toppled Braun once again in our second 5 star match, and then Akira and T-Bar went over in our third. So far, this show was near enough perfect. And what better way to round it off than EO Sky reclaiming her gold in yet another 5 star match for NXT. Of course we got an amazing booking rating, and gained the most fans by a country mile. And none of this would have been possible without the sacrifice of one Jackson Smooth. With Mick Foley and Adam Pearce left flabbergasted by the quality of my show, I felt on top of the world. I hit them both with a bit of attitude, letting them know that I was the best, and moved on to continuing my reign of dominance. But not before I promised Braun a win in his next match, and that Wesley would not fight against T-Bar again. Sadly, what I didn't realise was that the men's tag team rivalry was only at level 2, and therefore did not complete at the PLE. This meant that I needed to continue putting them into matches, as I couldn't afford to mess around with starting a new feud. I knew that I was going to hurt Wes Lee's morale, but it had to be done. I used my quick recovery power card, and booked what I thought to be a great show, considering I didn't have a lot of budget left over from Extreme Rules. Edge went straight into the North American title picture, and Dexter got a massive push to the top of the card. I also signed Zelina to feud with Dewdrop, and put Natalia in a match with Io, as I wouldn't be able to put on a women's tag team match for quite some time. The show actually performed really well, with 3.5 star, 3 star, 3 star and 4 star ratings, and saw us gain the most fans from a weekly show to date, smashing everyone else out of the park yet again. As I rolled into week 7, Wes Lee was understandably not very happy, and certainly let me know about it. He took a moderate hit to his morale, and then Dexter Loomis reminded me that I'd apparently promised him a tag match with Strowman, so he ended up taking a major hit to his. Not a great start to the week, as I was now looking at two stars that I'd potentially have to shell out $100,000 to each in order to keep them for the future, but I didn't have time to think about that now. I had to stay focused on the task at hand, which was winning at all costs. I checked the power card store and decided to buy an Injury Rehab 3 card, as it would allow me to put on the women's tag match again, and they all had good stamina. However, this did cost me $50,000 and meant that I had very little cash to play with going into the show. Still, I did what I could and managed to put on some great matches, including a tables match for the men's title and an extreme rules match for the women's tag titles in the main event. Dexter and Lashley delivered a 4.5 star classic, Dewdrop and Zelina got a decent 2.5 star rating, then the men's tag match was an absolute disaster, only receiving a 2 star rating despite them having a level 3 rivalry going into it. Luckily though, the main event was a hit, and the ever-reliable women's tag match got a 4 star rating, with Natalia and Nikita Lyons defending their titles yet again. With an amazing booking rating, we smashed our record number of fans gained set last week, and of course, as per usual, were the best performers. Everything was looking good, and we were flying. Week 8 brought us crashing back down to earth though. Immediately, Dexter Loomis decides he wants $100,000 to stay, which we knew might happen, but still weren't prepared for it. We had to accept, as we needed him for our men's title feud. Then we had Wes Lee waiting to speak to us as well. Thankfully though, for whatever reason, he isn't complaining, but instead he's asking to be put in a match with T-Bar, the very man that he complained about being put in a match with before. I have no idea what happened there, but I'm just glad he didn't ask for $100,000, as we literally don't have it. 
Unfortunately, after that hit to our finances, I wasn't very confident. I knew that this show would be budget, and that we'd probably lose out to another brand as a result. So, I decided to be as petty as I could, and use a double cost card on Mick Foley, just to inconvenience him as much as I possibly could. The card itself was the best we could do with the resources at our disposal, with no match type stipulations whatsoever. Regardless, we ended up getting some amazing results, and actually got a good booking for the show. I thought we were down and out, but incredibly we gained 59,000 fans this week, and just about beat our three rivals. We might actually make it to week 10 after all. The next week started with a wonderful message from Mick Foley, crying about the double cost card we used. I've since screenshotted this message, and now it's hanging up on my bedroom wall so I can look at it every single day. But the positivity was quickly overshadowed as JC Jane came in demanding $100,000. Much like Dexter, I needed her. She was a part of a major feud going into week 10, and losing her would ruin my entire show. I took the hit and paid it, leaving myself with just $58,000 to book week 9's show. Somehow though, I managed to put together a solid card. But the arena booking alone meant that I couldn't have any charity promos on to help me out with fans. Alongside that, there wasn't much variety in the show and no stipulations at all. But there was one positive. Jackson Smooth was back, and he had a bone to pick with Grayson Waller. With their regular singles match sat in the midcard, I had a slight bit of confidence when advancing, knowing that at least one of my matches was going to get 5 stars. Edge and Humberto kick things off with a 3.5 star great match, then Jackson and Waller put on the iconic match that we all knew they would. Sadly though, the men's tag team drastically overperformed and ended up getting a 4 star rating, meaning that the 3.5 star we got in the main event threw off the drama curve entirely. As predicted, we received a poor finale rating and gained 46,000 fans. But was that enough? Oh no. 